<laughs> All right, so the theme of what I want to share this morning is present tense grace. Now, we talk a lot about grace in this church. Um, you know, we say we're a grace church. Um, we preach the gospel of grace. We say this one or that one is a grace preacher. And I know that we know what that means. We know what we're talking about. But maybe sometimes people that listen to us on, online are wondering, what's all this emphasis on grace? What's this about? Well, of course, grace is what makes Christianity unique. Take grace out of Christianity and it just becomes another religion. And Jesus didn't come to start another religion. He said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And it's the grace of God that makes the difference. Grace, of course, is all about what God has done for us. So when we, when we don't focus on grace, we focus on what we are doing for God. I often give this definition that legalism or religion believes that my works are the basis for God's acceptance and blessing in my life. Now, that's what religion does. So therefore, if that's the case, my focus will always be on myself. Am I doing enough? Am I doing well enough? Uh, you know, I'm, so I end up beating up on myself and condemning myself because I'm not doing enough. I don't feel worthy enough because I've focused on self. But grace believes that I will always be accepted and always be blessed because of the finished work of Jesus. Amen. And so that's why we preach grace. We want people to focus on Jesus, to trust in him, to rest in him, to have their confidence in him, to enjoy the freedom and the liberty and the joy and the peace that comes with believing in Jesus. Amen. Now, grace is more than just the unmerited favor of God. Okay, we know that. Grace uh, basically is the energy that God gives to us in every area of our lives, everything we do is by grace. So we're not looking to ourselves to try to make something happen or to be good enough or whatever, to do well enough. We're looking to God working in us. We often use this statement, stop living for Jesus, let him live through you. That's grace. By faith, you know, I can't do this, I can't do that, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We bring the grace of God. So we, we step into this realm, this dimension of grace when we become believers and it operates through faith by just believing that Jesus in us is enough. Amen. Now here is just some of the things the Bible says about grace, okay? We'll go through them quickly. We are saved by grace, not of works lest any man should boast. It's by what he's done for us, not what we do here but what he did there at the cross. We are justified by grace. We stand in grace. We grow in grace. We are free from sin's dominion by grace. We are taught by grace how to say no to sin and to live righteously. We reign in righteousness by grace. We serve by grace. We are what we are by the grace of God. We have abundance of grace. In fact, we have grace heaped upon grace. What that means is your life is like a receptacle and you need grace for every situation. And so that grace leaks out, as it were, but as fast as it's leaking out, there's more grace coming in. Your cup is always full of the grace. Grace heaped upon grace. That's the meaning of that. Whatever we may go through, God gives us more grace. More than what? More than what you're going through. His grace will always be sufficient. That's the next thing. The Christian life consists in discovering all the riches of God's grace. It's an exciting journey. Christianity has become exciting when you understand it's all about grace. And then throughout eternity, we're not finished, we will be magnifying the grace of God. Now that's just a quick summary of uh, you know, some of the things the Bible says about grace. There's actually over a hundred references to the grace of God in the New Testament. And I could, I could you know, uh, preach a message on every one of those. So I'm, I'm not going to, don't worry. <laughs> but grace basically is the empowerment that God gives to us for the totality of life. 
Whatever you are facing, and you don't know what you will face, but you do know this, you are sufficient for it. You're empowered for the totality of life on planet Earth by the grace of God. But this is what I want to speak about this morning. We receive God's grace one day at a time. Amen? Amen. One day at a time. One of the differences between God and us is that we are limited to time and space. But God is not. We are finite. God is infinite. You know, God is the God who was and is and is to come. But we are limited to time on planet Earth. Now, how does God give us time? Well, in measurements of one day at a time, marked by the rise and set of sun. So he gives us our lives one day at a time. And in that day, he promises you've got all the grace that you'll need for whatever you face today. But many do not experience God's grace because of two reasons. And you can probably guess what they are. The first one is they are living in the future. They're trying to live in the future. Actually, the future is forbidden territory for us. Today is the territory that God has given to us. Tomorrow belongs to God. So to, to, to live in the future is the trespass on forbidden territory. Now, how, how can we do that? Two ways. By presuming, by presuming about tomorrow. The Bible says, do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring forth. I remember once when I was uh, living in New Zealand, we, uh, we uh, had a ministry team uh, and uh, we used to go away to what they called a batch. If, you know, if you're a New Zealander, you know what a batch is. Um, and uh, we went away for a weekend to discuss different things of the church. And I noticed where we were staying there on the fridge, there was like this circular wooden thing, fridge magnet. And I went over to it and, and it said this, this is a to it and it's round. I've always wanted to get a round to it. <laughs> this is what this is saying is, you know, putting off to tomorrow what really we should be doing today. Okay, because the grace of God is with us today, but we just keep putting it off, putting it off and putting it off until tomorrow. I think there's another verse in the New Testament, in James it is actually, which says a similar thing. It says, come on now. It says that. It says, come on now. You who say tomorrow we're going to go to this city and that city we're going to buy and sell and make a profit. And you shouldn't say that. James says, you say, if the Lord wills, we'll do this and that. Don't presume upon tomorrow. Now, now one of the areas, and I've got to say this because we never know who's listening online, is the, the area of salvation. People do this all the time regarding salvation, and it's very, very serious. Salvation is what God is giving to us through his son, Jesus Christ. God has given to us forgiveness of sins, the gift of righteousness, and eternal life, and it's all free. All you need to do is receive it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It cannot be any simpler than that. Amen? But people hear that, they've got nothing to lose, everything to gain, and yet they keep putting it off. Maybe tomorrow I'll do that. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I cannot stress this enough. If you're listening and you've never Ask Jesus to be your saviour. Do it now, right now. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my saviour. Paul says in the New Testament, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Amen. Don't put it off. But here's another thing. Reconciliation. Okay. Sometimes we fall out with, with um, different people. That's life happens to all of us, we have a disagreement or whatever, and, and we get upset and we know that we can't deal with it when we're upset. But God understands that and he gives us a day to settle down, to calm down. Then he says this, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Get it right before the end of the day. You know what it's like in marriage, you know? You have a little argument, a disagreement, and 
You go to bed. If you don't, if you don't sort it out then, you turn your backs on one another, <laughs> it's harder tomorrow, isn't it? It's harder tomorrow. And then it gets harder and harder and harder. And that little wrath thing there, that anger, turns into bitterness. And it creeps into relationships. And, and that's because there's grace today to resolve things, but it gets harder if you put it off tomorrow. Now's the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it, the Bible says. This is the day God's given it to us. We can do anything that we need to do by his grace. Amen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay, so here's another area where we, we can um, live in the future, and that's by worrying. Worry always concerns the future. Now, three things I'm saying here about worry. The first thing is destructive. You know the Greek meaning in the Bible for the word worry or anxiety, the literal meaning is to tear in half. It means like if I was to take this, uh, this paper on which my sermon is and tear it in half, two parts, that's the meaning of the word worry. Now, I'm not going to do that because this is a good sermon. <laughs> um, but that's the meaning. Why, why, why does it mean that? Because half of you has gone off into the future. You're worrying about all the things that might happen, could happen, and, and what you would do about it, right? But the other half, of course, is here where you really are. You're torn in half. You're torn apart. That's the meaning of that. And incidentally, by the way, they reckon that 90% of the things we worry about don't happen anyway. Interesting, isn't it? And uh, so the next thing then is that worry makes us sick because we're, we're, we want to do something about those things we're anxious about and all this chemical and electrical energy is surging around inside us and it's got nowhere to go. So it's eating away at the lining of our stomach and doing other things damaging things to our health, and we get sick through worry. And then the, the next thing is that it paralyzes us. It paralyzes. You know, you know in the Bible, um, there's the parable of the, the talents. And the man with the one talent hid his, ta hid his talent. Why did he hide his talent? Do you remember what he said? I was afraid. What was he afraid of? Why wasn't the other two men afraid? My view is this, Jesus said it was the one with the one talent. One man had five talents, you remember? One had two, and the other one had one. And that was the one who was afraid. He was worried about something, and he went and hid his talent. I reckon it's because he compared himself. I'm not as good as, I don't have as many gifts, I can't do as much as this person, so therefore, you, you know, I, I might fail. Recording in progress. Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> And, and so he was afraid and it paralyzed him. He did nothing because he was afraid. Because he was afraid. That's what worry does. It paralyzes us. And um, I, I reckon a classic example of that is the life of Timothy. I call him timid Timothy because he was prone to fear and, and anxiety and worry. That, that's pretty clear. And... Um, Paul noticed that when, when he was writing his first letter to Timothy because Timothy started to get afraid. You know, in the ministry, especially back in those days, it was dangerous, you know, and it wasn't easy. And, and Timothy was a young man, even in the church. Some of the older men were despising his youth, undermining him, undercutting him. And, and, and you know, there's all the problems of the church and then there's these false doctrines that come in all the time and you've got to deal with them. Otherwise they spread. And then there's the fear of persecution. And so Timothy was starting to get afraid. And, 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 and Paul said to him, Timothy, do not neglect the gift of God that is within you. Why did he say that? He saw him starting to back away, to back off, to, to cool down, because he was afraid. Worry was paralyzing him. You know when he wrote his second letter to Timothy? He'd already laid down his gift. Paul had to say to him, stir up the gift of God that's within you. 
it's like a fire. You, you look at it, you think, is, is that fire still alight? And you stir it up, you, you poke it around, and, and then all of a sudden it does burst into flame again, and you have a fire. That's what Paul was saying to Timothy, is you've let the whole thing go, go cold on you. Now stir up the gift of God that is within you. Worry, paralyze. Because, uh, incidentally, <laughs> you can understand in a sense, because Paul wrote that letter from prison. It was the last letter he wrote and uh, very soon after that he was executed. So Timothy's probably thinking, it could be my turn next, okay? Don't worry about it, just trust your life to God. You know, somebody said you'll die if you worry, you'll die if you don't, so why worry? <laughs> now what is the answer to worry? The answer to worry is today. Listen to what Jesus said. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow for sufficient Sorry, for tomorrow we'll worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Do what you can do today. What's in front of you today? What do you need to do today? Do that. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Amen? I remember hearing a story, I think I might have shared this with you in the past, but it uh, illustrates the story of this, um, this skinny man in Canada who applied for a job as a lumberjack. And you know, all these big burly guys were having their tea break and he comes up and says, excuse me, you got any jobs? You know, you got any vacancies? And everybody laughed at him. And then one guy said, give him a chance, give him a go. So they took him out to where the trees were, they gave him this big ax and he went swish with one swipe, boom. This tree came down, just one, one go. So I said, wow, do, the, do it again. So I went up to a bigger tree, swish, bang. Do it again. Went up to this other tree, swish, bang. I said, that's amazing. Where did you learn to chop down trees like that? <laughs> he said, in the Sahara forest. <laughs> He said, the Sahara Forest. He said, you mean the Sahara Desert, don't you? He said, well, that's what they call it now. <laughs> well, you see, the problem is we see a forest in front of us. She said, forget the forest. Just take the first tree in front of you. What, what can you do today? If you worry about tomorrow, you will not do anything today. That's what Jesus was saying there. You've got enough to do today. There's the grace to do it. Do what you can do today. And, uh, you know, you know we're, we're sort of focusing a bit on, on Russia at the moment and the, the rebuilding of the Soviet Union. But in the, in the days when the, the Soviet Union was at its full strength and the church we knew were, was really getting persecuted, um, th there's a story because some, some ministries were ministering to the underground church, you know, from the West. Uh, and then they would bring back reports. They'd go to churches in the West and tell them what's happening and take up offerings to, to support them and that sort of thing. And the guy, one of the guys that was doing that, he went to a church and he told this story. And, and I always think, should I tell this story? It's a horrible story, but it, it, it had happened, okay? These Christians were in a church worshipping just like we are now, okay? And the soldiers just poured into the church with their guns, marched everyone outside and dug a big hole. And they put the kids in the hole and they said you deny Christ tell, you know you deny that it's a load of rubbish it's a load of nonsense it's God business you deny it or we will bury your children alive and he said the parents did not deny Christ and the kids were buried alive but then he said to the congregation could you do that could you stand up for Jesus like that? And a, a lady in the church there was just absolutely, she just fell apart and she, she called a pastor in the middle of the week and said, Pastor, I can't be a Christian anymore because I could not do what that man asked us to do. I could not do that. He said, you do not even have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. You don't know what you could do when it comes because you don't see the grace of God that's waiting for you when it comes, because that's tomorrow. You know, the Bible says, take up your cross daily. 
you, there's a cross for you to take up today. There, there, it, you know, whatever that means, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a task before you today. That's all that God wants you to focus on today. There's grace for all that God will ask you to do today. Forget tomorrow. Forget the maybes and the could be's and, and so on. Just do what you have to do today. This is what the Bible says. As your days, so will your strength be. As your days, so will your strength be. And then we, we sing a hymn around this verse. I love it. His compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. You know, the things you worry about, you think, how am I going to cope with that? Then you get into tomorrow and it's there. Then you discover the grace of God, the, the compassions of God, the mercies of God. And, and you, you realize there's nothing to worry about. There was nothing to worry about. All I needed to do was to trust and to focus on today. Today belongs to us. Tomorrow belongs to God. Jesus is not saying that we should, not, uh, should make no preparation for tomorrow. That's different. But protecting us from the kind of anxiety which tears us apart. I mean, the farmer has to sow a seed if he's going to get a harvest tomorrow. Down the track, amen? But his job is to sow the seed, not to keep digging up the seed to see how he's doing. Just sow the seed and trust God. Do what we can do today and trust God for tomorrow. Okay, let's move on. The second uh, way in which people might not experience the grace of God by not living in today is, of course, living in the past. Here are three things that we might say that would take us back in the past. The first one is, yesterday was better than today. The good old days. You know, a lot, a lot, often people talk about the good old days. I think they've got a selective memory. <laughs> yeah. For example, camera please. Thank you, follow me, thank you. <laughs> Make sure you're alive, you're awake Chris. Okay, now, in this phone, I carry around with me. If I didn't have that, I'd have to carry a calendar, a photo album, a camera, a calculator, you know, all the other things. I, c I can send a message to someone on the other side of the world, and it's there in seconds. You know, remember the old days when you used to write a letter to someone on the other side of the world and wait a couple of weeks before you got the reply back? The good old days. I'm not so sure about that, but, but sometimes people can bring that into the church, in, into the faith. And they, you know, the, the old days were better. God was doing greater things back then. God was bigger back then. And they talk about the good old days. Selective memory again. Selective memory. There's a situation in the, in the um, I think it's the book of Haggai, where the children of Israel have been into captivity and they came back and the first thing they wanted to do was to rebuild the temple. And they laid the foundations. And when they came together to celebrate the laying of the foundations, the young men were rejoicing. But the old men wept because they said, we remember the former glory, the glory of Solomon's temple. And, and this temple is, is not as glorious. It won't be as glorious. Friends, it's not the temple. It's the God who inhabits the temple. Amen? And, and Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. So this idea of the old days were better. Some people just live in a time warp. Yesterday is not better than today. Today could be the best day of your life. In fact, the Bible says that as we go on, you know, uh, the, the, the path of the just is like the shining light. It shines more and more to the perfect day. You know, sometimes I, on Facebook, I see a, a group of older pastors getting together, having coffee, and I think, I'm wondering if they're talking about the good old days. <laughs> you know, the good old days when God used to move, you know. Now we're just sucking our, thumb, sucking our gums till Jesus comes. <laughs> no, no, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Some even look back longingly to the old life, especially when things get tough. You know, when, when life gets tough, people think, you know, it was better back then, even better before I was a Christian. That's the way the devil works. 
That's why there's so many warnings in the Bible not to look back. What did Jesus say? Remember Lot's wife. She looked back longingly to Sodom. Can you believe it? As it was being destroyed, wanting to go back there. There's nothing back there, friends. Nothing back there. Jesus said, anyone having set his hand to a plow, looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God because you know that in plowing, all they had to do was to look at one point ahead of them, keep their eyes fixed on that one point and they'd plow a straight line. And we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We're going forwards, onwards and upwards. Amen. That was the problem in the wilderness, wasn't it? They came out and then, then they, things got difficult and they started talking about going back to Egypt. Can you believe that? Can you really? I mean, like, where, where is the sense, that even the logic of going back to Egypt? Can you imagine them turning up there, you know? This big group of people coming back into Egypt. Hey, you remember us? You remember we used to be your slaves and then God set us free and you chased after us and then God judged you and killed your Pharaoh and all your son. We're back. <laughs> Oh, welcome. I don't think they're getting much of a welcome. There's nothing back there, friends. Nothing back there. I, I, um, as I was thinking about this, I just really had it impressed upon my heart. I don't know if it's for anybody that's listening to this online or whatever, but I'm going to say it is that, you know, the enemy would try to take people back into addiction. Whatever that addiction is, saying... Just one more fix. I'll go back there and get one more fix. You know it's not one more fix. It's the first of an addiction. Don't go back there. There's nothing back there. God has set us free. I don't know if you noticed, recently we, we lost a, a very good athlete, uh, Australian. His name was John Landy. Anybody aware of John? John Landy was a great runner. And um, there, there used to be a time when people thought there was an invisible barrier in running a mile faster than four minutes. They thought you could not, it was impossible. And then in May 1954, an English guy called Roger Bannister ran a mile just under four minutes. The next month, John Landy ran faster. And so the inevitable was that these two would meet. And that happened in August 1954. And, and, and as they were coming into the home straight, John Landy was in front. But it was Roger Bannister that touched the tape first. When they asked John Landy, what happened? You had the race all sewn up. He said this, I couldn't resist the urge to look back. I couldn't resist the urge to look back. And it was when he looked back, Bannister went past him. Resist the urge to look back. There's nothing back there. Today is the day that God has given to us. Amen? Some people say this, I'm a product of the past. You know, we talk about this sometimes um, when we're talking about the grace of God because sometimes people have an old covenant mentality. Now, I, won't, I know that you've heard me say this is in my book, This is the Life, so I won't spend a lot of time, but, but a lot of people do need to hear this that are hearing, uh, listening today because wrong doctrines come out of a misunderstanding of a passage in the Old Covenant that speaks about generational curses. You know, um, they believe that if you're struggling in life, if you've got some area of sickness or you can't get a financial breakthrough or whatever, you've got family problems, blah, blah, blah. The reason is there's a generational curse upon your life. Break that and you'll be free. And they base it on the scripture. And the scripture is, uh, God says, you know, I will visit the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. So generations later can be suffering for what their forefathers did. Okay. Now, what they don't understand is that that <laughs> it's smack bang in the old covenant. It's in Exodus 20 where the Ten Commandments was given. And, and God was saying, if you go off and worship other gods, I will visit your iniquity to the third and fourth generation. Okay? So then out of that comes this doctrine 
of breaking curses and people breaking curses, you know, so much for the finished work of Christ. He's dealt with everything at the cross. But anyway, they, they break this curse and that curse. Now, a couple of things. Number one, um, don't rebuke the devil. If you want to do that, rebuke God. Because he said, I will visit the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. So you're wasting your time binding the devil. It's God that's doing it. So rebuke him. And good luck with that one. The second thing is this. That's the old covenant. And Jeremiah said, you've broken that covenant. There's a new covenant coming. And no longer will they say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but everyone will suffer the consequences of his own actions. You won't reap what your parents have done to the third and fourth generation because you're a new creation. God has cut you off from your hereditary line, not three or four generations, but all the way back to Adam. You're no longer in Adam, you're in Christ. You're a new creation. Amen? You're not a product of your past. Second way that people talk about that is a victim mentality. A victim mentality. People say, I'm only, I've only got this problem today because of what someone did to me back then. Or, or what happened to me back then. They've got this victim mentality. I, I remember there's one church where um, I was pastoring and we had this guy in our church. And he was just causing trouble all the time. He was a troublemaker, you know. And uh, he wanted to preach. I mean, you don't give the pulpit to people like that. Obviously, because he's just bring a lot of poison out from the pulpit. And I said, no, you, you know, we're not going to put you up there. And he said, you know what? God has called me to preach, but pastors have always blocked me. I said, so let me get this right. God has called you to preach, but I'm more powerful than God. I've stopped you from preaching. <laughs> He didn't preach because of his own immaturity and his own problems. But some people have a victim mentality. You know, we're not victims, friends. We're victors. In all these things, God has made us to be more than conquerors. You are a victor through the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we triumph because he triumphed. We step into his victory. We step into his grace. And we're made sufficient for all things. Amen? Okay, the, the next thing in this area of being a product of the past, and this is a powerful thing, there's probably nothing that will hold you more back into the grip of the past than unforgiveness. No doubt about it. And, and we all have experienced, you know, offences, every one of us, and we learn to forgive. I think I mentioned the other day, the thing that helps me to forgive more than anything is to know that he has forgiven me everything, totally. How can I withhold forgiveness? But unforgiveness will hold you back there. That definition that I often quote is this. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. You think by not forgiving, you're punishing someone else. You're the one that's getting punished because you're held back into the past of what happened there. You're still locked into it. Whereas today you can, you can step out of it and step into the grace of God and move on. So it might sound selfish, but we forgive not for that person's sake, but for my sake. I need to forgive so that I can move on. Amen? Now, some people say, yeah, but I, I can't help how I feel about what happened to me. Feelings is not... Don't, don't misunderstand that your forgiveness has to do with the way you feel. You can't help the way you feel. So how do you know if you're forgiven? Here's a test. It's very simple. Very simple. See, our, our forgiveness of others must reflect God's forgiveness of us. That's real forgiveness. Because it's the forgiveness that he gives to us that we can give to others. So this is how you know whether you've really forgiven someone. Are you still talking about it? Because God says, your sins and your lawless deeds, I will remember no more. We'll mention that no more. It's forgiven, it's forgotten. There's no condemnation. I will never bring it up again. If you're still talking about it, you haven't forgiven. Just stop talking about it. 
just move on and, and step into the grace of God and all that God has got for you. Amen? Amen. I know that's a hard one, but, but it's, grace is there for that. Amen. Let's move on to the last thing then. This is what some people say that holds them back, how the past will hold them back. I failed in the past, so I won't try again. But I'm asking, what is failure? What is failure? To fall is not to fail. To fall and blame others is to fail. To fall and not to get up is to fail. Amen? What's that verse? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he falls, he shall not be cast down. In other words, he won't stay down. Amen? We all fall, but to get up again and go on again. A mistake is only a failure if we don't learn from it. What is success? What is success? Some people spend all their time trying to climb the ladder only to discover when it's, they get to the top that it was leaning against the wrong wall. What is success? God promises good success. You remember what he said to Joshua? If this word you know, remains in your heart, you meditate on it day and night, then you will have good success. That's what I want good success. I don't want success. I want good success. What's the difference? I can be rich and famous and popular and have a big church, but if that makes me arrogant and haughty and self-centered and narcissistic and narcissistic or whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? Is that success? Or I can, I can have a, you know, like just be a nobody in, in the eyes of a lot of people, but be humble and gracious, help others, kind to others. Is that a failure? Or is that success? I want good success. Success that God calls success. Amen. And so, what I'm saying to you is this. Live in the present tense grace. Live in the present tense grace. I think it was the Scottish poet that said, uh, Robert Burns said, life is but a day at the most. It's true. Now is the day of salvation. This is the day the Lord has made. This is where we're living. This is where we're living. This is where the grace of God is upon us. Let's step into the fullness of his grace today. Don't get caught back in the past. Don't travel off into the future. But live today in the fullness. You know, it's like your life is like the hourglass. You know, there's, a, there's all the grains of glass, when, and we, uh, grains of sand, sorry, in the top portion of the hourglass, and the, they represent the days that are yet to come, and probably not many of them <laughs> left. There's all the grains down the bottom, the days that are past, but there's one grain that's just making its way from one channel to the other. That's today. We live in this time capsule. Close with this. But if you can read it. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. But today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. Now, that's not original. I, I got that from uh, Kung Fu Panda 2, if you saw the movie. <laughs> Amen. It's a gift. It's God's gift to you and I today. Embrace it. Know that you're sufficient for all things. You're totally empowered for whatever you face today. And when tomorrow becomes today, same again. Grace heaped upon grace. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your precious word and the precious truth of your present tense grace. Lord, we know that one time we will live with you in eternity, but now we're living on this planet in the capsule of time, and we thank you that we've been made sufficient every day that we come into this uh, wonderful grace of God. So Lord, teach us how to live by faith in the Son of God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.